right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. First and foremost, before we dive in, I just wanna say a huge thank you to all our classrooms joining live on YouTube, Facebook, wherever you happen to be in the world. Uh, I know it's been a crazy eight months of class or not class for all of you uh, worldwide. And so it's so nice of you to spend some of your time in your first month back with us as we continue to highlight amazing scientists, conservationists, and explorers around the globe. So September has been our crazy busy month. I think by the end of the month, it's 55 sessions in 16 days, which is insane. So if you've been joining us, we really appreciate uh, you coming in. And our main topic for this month has been ocean plastic. This is something that is on a lot of schools' minds. It's on a lot of people's minds around the world. Uh, the issue in general, how to do more research on it, and some of the solutions. So I'm really, really excited today to dive in with our speaker, who I don't even usually do this. I, I usually memorize it all, but there's just so much that our speaker today has done that I have to read off a little bit of it. So I'll welcome in uh, Dr. Tierney Teese uh, with beautiful flowers to boot. And so today she's going to be talking about creating sustainable textiles, uh, working with communities to help make uh, a difference in finding innovative solutions to plastic pollution. But her career is so wide and varied. She has helped study the ocean sunfish, Mola Mola, one of the coolest animals in the world. She's been on a producer on documentaries. She works to bring nature to nature deprived communities. She's done it all. A National Geographic Explorer, a doctor of biomechanics, the list goes on and on and on. Um, so I'm thrilled, I'm excited for the presentation. I hope you guys all are too. Dr. Tees, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, looking forward to taking us away. You did have a question right before I pressed that button. So if there's anything I can answer for you before we dive in, please ask away too. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm set. Thank you so much, Jesse. It's great to be, to be, to see all of you guys. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm talking to you from Central California. And um, just a, a shout out to the native Esalen and Rumsian people who have occupied this and uh, this land um, before us and and continue to at least their their descendants. Um, and just a big thank you to Joe Grabowski and Jesse and um, exploring by the seat of your pants. I just really applaud what you're doing and all the speakers that have come before me. Such such a great resource. So thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> um, so I'm super excited to take you guys on a journey with me. I'm still in the middle of this journey into finding out about sustainable textiles. And um, we, our journey begins in the ocean, it goes on to land, and then I go right into your closet. What, you're thinking? Well, let's dive in. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. Make sure we can do that. Um, share it right and is that is that working, Jesse? Yes. Yeah, perfect. You're good to that? go. Okay. All right. Okay. As Jesse mentioned, yes, I'm a marine biologist. I've spent a lot of time underwater in the ocean. Um, I was born here in California, but I used to go to the beach with my parents, who made me a little wetsuit out of neoprene um, that didn't have any zippers, so I could never take it off without tearing out my hair. So I spent a lot of time in the wetsuit in the ocean. And one of my favorite critters is this ocean sunfish, the world's heaviest bony fish. Um, just finished a book on them that's gonna be coming out in a couple months. So I've been following this fish all over the world from Galapagos to um, Bali, Indonesia, Australia, Africa, all over the place, spending a lot of time in the water. And the more you're in the ocean, the more unfortunately you're exposed to the incredible waste that we're pouring into the ocean. And um, no matter where I'd go, I would find this. No matter how remote an area, I would find trash on the beaches. So there's no way to turn a blind eye to that. And it turns out that about 80% of the trash in our ocean is derived from plastic. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these heartbreaking images that my friend Chris Jordan has made of seabirds that eat the plastic, mistaking it for food. So it's not just unsightly, it's actually um, super dangerous to the animals that, that, that eat it, which includes ourselves. Um, and plastic doesn't go away. It, it, it concentrates pollutants, nasty chemicals. Um, so there's a lot of problems with it. This little guy in Belize, a uh, little hermit crab, you know, he couldn't find a, a, a decent shell to live in, so he had to take up residence in this, this um, trashed pen cap, 
and he had a devil of a time carrying, you know, trying to drag his little body around. So it's really, uh, we're making a lot of challenges for, for the animals in the ocean. Um, the big problem with plastic is that it doesn't go away, but it breaks down and it breaks down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And those spread ubiquitously out through the ocean. A rather sobering fact is that there's 500 times more pieces of plastic in the ocean than there are stars in our galaxy. And that is a whole lot of plastic when you think we've got over 500 billion stars just in the Milky Way alone. <clears throat> so 60% of what we wear and what we clothe ourselves in is actually made from plastic. If you look at your clothing label, and it says acrylic, polyester, nylon, lycra, lasting spandex, that is all plastic. Plastic equals oil. And so we are actually wrapping ourselves in fossil fuels. And it's our clothing that's releasing trillions of little plastic microfibers into the ocean. Those little fibers, when we wash our clothes that have synthetics, um, like, our, like our polyesters and acrylics, they shed little tiny fibers that get into our water, out our washing machine, they they out into the into the streams and the rivers and the ocean where they concentrate even more pollutants. Animals eat them, they get into our bodies that way. Um, and a rather sobering uh, finding is that when we dry our clothes, that breaks a lot of the fibers and they go out our drying vent. So if ever you've been drying your clothes and you go outside and you kind of smell your dryer going and you look over at that dryer vent, you'll see all these little fibers coming out. They're being liberated into the air and they're getting rained down all through the land. So it's not just in the ocean. We're getting microfibers spread across the land through our dryers. Three times more come out of our dryers than into the water. So at this point, you're probably thinking, ah, what can I do? This problem seems so large. It seems so intractable. Um, well, there's a lot we can do as individuals. And maybe some of you have been thinking, huh, well, what if I wear cotton? Cotton's natural. Cotton's not made from plastic. And it turns out 40% of our clothing is made from cotton. And cotton is a natural fiber, but is it good for the planet and good for humanity? Well, that all depends on how it's grown and where it's grown. Because cotton can have an enormous environmental footprint if it's not grown in the right place and if it's grown in a destructive way. Cotton uses an enormous amount of water. And when it's grown in a monoculture like this, um, <clears throat> then... It actually requires lots of fertilizer, lots of pesticides, which create a lot of chemicals that get emptied into our environment. Um, often the people picking the cotton, harvesting the cotton, aren't treated very well. And that's all part of the equation as to whether it's a good substitute for synthetics. One really big example of cotton's big footprint is the Aral Sea over in Uzbekistan with the former Soviet Union. Water that was feeding the Aral Sea is diverted to, to grow cotton, and then the Aral Sea is pretty much dried up, filled with um, chemicals and pesticides, and there's a concerted effort to save the Aral Sea, but we've got a long way to go to repair the damages that have been caused by taking water out of it to grow cotton and do something about all the pollutants that are in there. So when we talk about a sustainable fabric and sustainable fashion, you have to think in the whole system, the environment, the economy, and society. So it can be a natural fabric like cotton, but it has to be grown in a way that is um, not using a lot of chemicals, not using too much water, um, that it treats the workers fairly, that it's traded fairly, that everyone within that supply chain is, um, is treated equally and, and in a fair manner. And it still has to be economic. And you need to find that sweet spot to make it truly a sustainable fabric. And then when you sell it, how is it packaged? How is it transported? What's its environmental footprint? Its carbon footprint in terms of how much um, CO2 emissions are 
are part of its whole supply chain to get from the field to the store. All these things need to be taken into consideration. And that's where this idea of circular economy comes in. The people who are manufacturing and making the money off selling the products really need to be able to think about the whole life cycle of the product. When it's done, let's say you're done wearing something. Can Is there a place that you can send your fabric to be recycled, upcycled into something useful instead of ending up in the landfill? And more and more manufacturing companies are looking to that whole life cycle to make sure that they're not just creating something that they make profit off of and it just ends up in the landfill. So trying to bolster products with a circular economy is really a, hot on people's minds right now. And that's just really taking a leaf out of nature's book. Nature's had a four billion year head start on manufacturing. <laughs> And when something decays in the natural world, it gives back nutrients. This is a picture of a nurse log up in the Redwood um, National Redwood Forest, north of me. And um, as the redwood tree degrades, it, it liberates nutrients for all sorts of additional plants and fungi and animals to take advantage of. So that's the kind of ecosystem we need to create when we're creating our fabrics that we wrap ourselves in. How can we create fabrics that make nutrients and food instead of waste and trash? And there's so many super cool fabrics that are made from natural products. You can make fabric from banana trees, from pineapple. You can make silk from pineapple. You can make fabrics from soy waste, from the husks of coconuts. You can make fabrics from nettles. Any of you guys brushed up against nettles? Whew, wow, they really sting. But nettles are an amazing fabric that have, um, you can eat them, they have vitamin C, and the, the stems make these incredibly um, robust fabrics, str much stronger than cotton, um, and and warm and and durable. So, and they were actually, um, um, soldiers in World War II used to use nettles, nettle fabric uh, for their uniforms. Um, lotus is another incredible fabric that is believed to be the most spiritually, uh, one of the most spiritual fabrics in the world because the Buddha, the Buddha would wear only be clothed in lotus. The lotus is very symbolic in that it rises from the, the mud into this, into the light, um, like the path of enlightenment of the Buddhas. And, um, and you could make fabric from the stems of lotus. And I'll show you some of that when, um, in just a few minutes. Hemp is a great fabric alternative um, to synthetics in that it doesn't use nearly as much water as, as cotton. It's weedy, it, um, it grows in lots of places. And a lot of companies are looking to make more of their clothing out of hemp. <clears throat> Capox, another super cool one I'll show you. Um, I'll show you some examples of that in just a few moments. It's from the tree origin, um, native to Central and South America. Now it's grown all over the world. Sisal is a really, really robust fabric that you make carpets out of. And every one of these fibers has a story. Um, for example, sisal <clears throat> is actually parts of the, the cables that the little cable cars in San Francisco hook onto and go around up, the, up and down the big hills. The cables of the San Francisco cable cars at the heart of them is sisal because it's so strong in tensile strength. <clears throat> and all sorts of really interesting fabrics being made in the lab, a realm called biosynthetics. Circulose is one example. It's made from worn out clothing that gets um, uh, sort of sloshed into a slurry, added with wood pulp from wood waste, and made into a fabric that Levi Strauss is making jeans from with a much, much lower uh, water footprint. It takes gallons and gallons of water to make fabric. And so this is a way of reducing the water footprint. Bolt threads, which is located right up here next to... Um, next to the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. They have genetically engineered uh, fungi to make 
mycelial fabric. They call it Milo. And it's kind of like a leather fabric, a vegan leather. There's a company called that makes something called Spy, which is a genetically engineered uh, process of making proteins that that are spider silk proteins. Not so good to try and get spy all these spiders in a lab to work together because number one, they're cannibals. So, <laughs> so it's kind of easier to genetically engineer bacteria and yeast to, to create spider-like silk proteins. And North Face has made a, um, a parka called the moon parka where the external covering is made from this this material called spiber. There's so many really interesting biosynthetic fabrics being made. And you can find out about those by going to aboutbiosynthetics.org. And lots of companies are trying to um, experiment and make products with those. Um, so let's see. So here's a growing number of brands that are looking to do the right thing. Patagonia has a whole, a whole branch where you can send in your your old parka and they'll fix it for you or they'll um, they'll resell um, <clears throat> lightly used clothing so and they're also they have been searching into sustainable sustainability with their fabrics for many many years so they they really do their homework when it comes to reducing their environmental footprint other brands include Code Epoxy, Eileen Fisher, Allbirds makes their shoes out of wool, sustainably sourced merino wool. Pan, Pangaea, I'll show you some pictures, um, some examples of, of fabrics from Pangaea. Deep into material science, Amanda Parks has um, started Pangaea and they make shirts out of seaweed and cotton and lots more. And Adam, the, the the sweater I'm wearing is made from Nadam, sustainably sourced Mongolian cashmere. Um, so lots of these, and I've mentioned um, North Face and Levi Strauss. Um, there's some really great resources to look, um, to educate yourself more. Nike made an app called Making, and you can type in different fabrics and see what their footprint is in terms of water, in terms of carbon emissions, and you can compare them all. It's a really nicely laid out, deeply resourced and deeply um, researched app that you can download. Whenever I'm getting down about how big this problem is, I always type in, <laughs> I check out the Biomarket Insights newsletter because they're always talking about larger scale developments of big manufacturing companies that are trying to do the right thing and trying to lower their, their environmental footprint, taking advantage of innovations in green chemistry, material science, and design innovations. And then you can look at the textile exchange, which um, has all sorts of really interesting information on late breaking developments in the fiber world. Um, if you're really turned on by textiles, which I have become, um, there's some great books out there, like 5,000 Years of Textiles. You know, textiles are, are really this deeply creative way of expressing who we are as humans. Every culture has a textile form, and it's our way of speaking in skeins, speaking in, through fabrics, and clothing ourselves from the past into the future. So it's such an interesting avenue to study, very interdisciplinary. And here are some of the books that can take you deep into there. I'm just finishing up reading The Golden Thread, How Fabric Changed History. And it's absolutely fascinating, especially when you think of it from an explorer's point of view. We can only go to different parts of the world, like the polar reaches or underwater, because of innovations or outer space for that matter, innovations in what we wrap our bodies in. So endlessly fascinating. And I'm looking forward to this book coming out, The Fabric of Civilization. That'll be coming out um, in next month, a couple months, yeah. So what can we do as individuals? Well, you know, as humans, we buy a hundred billion pieces of clothing a year. Is that really necessary? So let's, we can think before we buy, look at the label, buy clothes that last long, that aren't just gonna fall apart. You can swap clothes with your friends so you don't have to buy new stuff, re-wear your clothes and treat your clothing well. I'm 
I've started this project called Around the World in 80 Fabrics. Um, you can check it out on Instagram. And we're searching for sustainable, sustainable textiles around the world and interviewing artisans at small scale, celebrating small scales. Let's go three corner of the globe, gathering facts, and I'll show you some of those um, when I when I get back on screen with you. Um, and we're making a teaching quilt and a book and an app, and that'll all be coming out in the next couple years. So stay tuned on that front. Um, and here's just a, a couple couple pointers that you can do now to reduce the the microfibers specifically. Um, you know, like I said, check what your clothes are made of. But when you you know you don't have to wash your clothes all the time. Um, don't wash them in super hot water because that degrades your clothes. Don't put tennis shoes in with with delicate fibers um hang dry your hang dry your clothes and try to capture the fibers coming out of your dryer vent it'll make a huge difference so i want you just to remember that what you wear ends up out there and my great dream is that um, you know when my kids are grown these are my two little munchkins um when they're grown up that they say Mommy, remember when we'd go to the beach and we'd find trash on the beach? And man, I'm so glad that we cleaned up our act. <laughs> that's that's my dream. That they'll they'll tell me when I when I get old and they're with a walker and they're they're they've got their jobs that they're walking on the beach and they're not having to pick up trash. And they're telling me that they're so happy that the world is different from the world they grew up in. So I will now stop sharing and um, come back to you guys see yeah fantastic well what fun was that i mean not only do we get to highlight pretty much every message that i was hoping you were going to touch upon in that talk and, and cover something that we've always skirted as an issue it's always been something that sort of get added on to other talks and we dove in headlong today so i'm really excited about that but we got the unexpected phrase of <laughs> cannibal spiders which is really I don't know what you're that i'm thrilled about so yeah. thanks tierney um so uh, let's dive in with questions. Uh, we've got people joining in on YouTube and Facebook. If you're there, let me know where you're joining from from around the world. I'd love to see your questions. And we're going to go to Miss Kump's class and a story in New York in just a minute. But I wanted to kick off with a question of how, you know, with your, your experiences around the world, you've done a lot in the, the marine sphere. You've, you've literally traveled around the world to do this sort of work. What was there a specific instance, a specific moment that led you to be so interested in textiles? I mean, if, if people in their life can find something that they're as passionate about as you are about this, I think you're, you're pretty set, which is great. So anything well, led to it? Yeah, they just kept popping up. And they're just, um, you know, the more you travel, the more you see that that every culture has these beautiful, beautiful fabrics. I mean, like I've got, um, I've got textiles from India here. And then they tell their whole story through their fabrics. Um, and as a scientist and as a marine biologist, I was really concerned about seeing these microfibers. But then when you travel the world, you see that local communities have their own, they, they grow their, the, their, um, their crops there and they can make fabrics from them. And so just like when we think of a watershed, we can think of a fiber shed, you know, you could locally grow and source your just like you source your food, you could source your clothing. Um, and natural fabrics are just so, they're just so beautiful to work with. And, and they, you know, so I just got, I got entranced by the storytelling capability, um, the material science, and then the potential for, for, um, for celebrating small scale artisans, preserving culture, as well as um, moving into the future without making a, a huge mess. Yeah, that is a, a beautiful story for that. I love it. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, and hello to the classes uh, in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Ms. Cormier's class, and Akash joining us all the way in Vishakhapatnam in India, uh, who's been joining us for all sorts of sessions on, on marine plastics. So welcome into you guys. I want to go to Ms. Kump's class now. If you guys have a question for us, come on into the stream and uh, share away. Um, I would like to know, how do you get silk out of pineapples? Oh, how do you get silk out of pineapples? Yes, I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> because we know that silk usually comes from silkworms that, that make their little their little cocoons. And um, actually, uh, there's there's a kind of silk called ahimsa silk, where they don't kill the, the silkworm moth. Um, 
they they actually let it hatch out of its cocoon and then they take the cocoon um, and and um, preserve the animal. So there's there's good silk and bad silk, but they just call it silk from pineapple um, because it's so soft and it's actually extracted from um, you know from the leaves. And so not from the fruit itself, it's from the from the fibers and the leaves. And it's a very soft fabric. Yeah. yeah. But silk, I know we think of silk as being extruded from the animal, making its cocoon. Um, but but I think they're they're being a little uh, a little um generous with, with the terms pineapple silk, because it's not from any animal, it's from a plant, yeah. a bromeliad. Awesome. <laughs> guys. Um, one thing you touched upon a little bit at the end of the presentation might not be your main area of expertise, but I'm curious if you have any uh, insight on it, is washing and drying, how to make that process more effective so that those little microfibers don't end up in the water supply. Is there anything you've heard on this that you can share with us? Yes, actually, there's a bunch of um, a bunch of solutions there. Washing and drying are huge. Um, you've got, like I, like I mentioned, you've got the fibers, the different ways of washing. You know, you don't have to wash your clothes Every day. Hang drying is much better than drying in the dry because that releases lots of fibers out into the into the air. Um, really harsh chemicals in your detergents can break your fibers down, break break your clothes down. So just be gentle with your clothes so they last longer. Um, you can also, you know, um, synthetic fleeces like cinchillas, your fleeces. You might want to put them in something called the guppy's friend bag, which can trap microfibers um, when you wash them. And then there's a there's a ball called the Cora ball, and I think Daniela Russo spoke about this. You can put that in your washing your in your dryer to help capture, and in your washing machine to capture microfibers. So there's ways of doing ways of being more gentle when you wash your clothes and hang drying them. That makes a big difference. Yeah, fantastic. Um, all right, we've got a few questions on, on YouTube about kids that are more interested in sort of the how you got into this topic in the first place. So one of our questions from uh, Akash in India is, how did you find out that these tiny particles are reaching the ocean? You're, you're sort of beginning of your talk, you're highlighting microplastics breaking down. How did either you personally or how did we find out about that? That, that was an issue to be concerned about. Oh, yeah. Well, microfibers are a big issue because there's a lot of work that's been done, um, you know, um, in the UK where they found that 1,200 species of, of fish and shellfish and um, had little tiny plastic microfibers in them. Um, and so we're actually, we're, when we eat fish, when we're eating shellfish, we're eating the plastic that, that these animals themselves are eating. And I did, a, I did a film called The Secret Life of Plankton and then another one called The Plastic, um, um, The Complicated Journey of Marine Plastics. It's a TED Ed lesson. And in there you can see little tiny copepods, you know, they're they're filtering the water and they get these plastic microfibers in them. And you can see it, and then the fish eat those, and then we eat the fish. And so so it's um it's unavoidable almost for for creatures in the ocean to to not eat these tiny fabrics. I mean tiny fibers. So so um, as a marine biologist, I just kept seeing this coming up again and again. And, um, and where there were, there were projects to clean up, you know, to stop big amounts of trash going into the ocean yeah. at the river's edge or try to clean up big things. The little microfibers, that's a whole other problem. But it's so interesting to solve it, you know. Yeah. Which is exciting. I mean, one of the things we like, we've highlighted all month long with ocean plastics is that this is a relatively new field. I mean, most of this research has been done in the last 20 years. And I think most of that has been done in the last five. There are labs all over the world tackling this. And it's a great issue in that it's totally apolitical. No one looks at a beach covered in plastic. No one thinks of microplastics and goes, great, that's fantastic, but there's more plastic than fish. So that's a huge positive is that everyone is working towards this in, in a positive manner. So I'm excited we got a chance to, to bring that up. You mentioned a few things that I wanted just segue into for a second before we go to our next question. Uh, one, so yesterday, a, a nice compliment to this presentation. We had one by Daniela Russo, so at the bottom of your screen, you can see that. Um, so Tierney is associated with Think Beyond Plastic, which is the association that she talked about yesterday, which is fantastic. And something that I've loved sharing all month long, and, and speaking of rivers, rivers are, are the sort of conduit for a lot of plastics and fibers to the ocean, is Mr. Trash Wheel. If you want a fantastic and sort of social media friendly, amazing initiative, 
initiative to prevent stuff in, in rivers from reaching the ocean, check out Mr. Trash Wheel. It's awesome. Uh, and you'll see some really innovative solutions like that uh, around the world, which is great. I was so happy. I, I, I was about to mention Mr. Trash Wheel, who I, I love. I love Mr. Trash Wheel. And actually, I wanted someone to beat me to it. You would have been the first. I'm sorry I stole your thunder. Oh, no, no. There's actually, in the complicated journey of marine plastics, there's Mr. Trash Wheel is in there. <laughs> in the credits. For incentive for our class to check it out. Um, Ms. Cump, I'm going to come back to you in just two seconds. I want to go to Ms. Cormier's class first. What is the strangest piece of plastic you've encountered at the beach or the ocean? Dun, dun, dun. Oh, oh gosh. Um, that is that is a really hard one. Oh, you know, let me um let me show you. I'm so glad you brought that up. Two seconds. We're yeah. so excited. <laughs> Seriously, for anyone at home, you should have as much passion as Tyrion. Yeah, I am. I I do these. Um, you know, I make. Um, I I work with all sorts of school groups, and we go on beach cleanups, and then we make these great trash monsters. Yes. So, so um, we um we gathered trash, and we've made, and then we make them into these sculptures. And so these are some of the weird. There's like trash crab. There's plasto pig. Yeah, I like uh, the um. Echinoderma fuma basura made of cigarette butts. <laughs> There's the toilet tower of Pisa. <laughs> this is amazing. I am, I'm, I'm, I, that is, that, you know what? You, you never cease to amaze me in this presentation. <laughs> TV. That is awesome. Um, fantastic question, guys. I love it. Um, yeah, no, nothing can top that for weirdest pieces of plastic. Is, is <laughs> you guys, you guys could do this too. You could go on beach cleanups. Yep. And then you have this, um, you know, make these sculptures and then you, and then you make these, and then this was, you know, we put them on a black background, made these great posters. And then we got the, um, we got the local businesses to display them like big artwork. And so it was super exciting. It really raised awareness. And that's something that we're seeing a lot of lately. I've never seen anything quite like that, but making plastic sculptures of animals or of ships or of whatever is becoming an increasingly big thing. Museums, zoos around the world, the Toronto Zoo where I am had a, a program like that recently. Um, and one thing I'd love to highlight for, for kids at home, this is a, a Canadian initiative, but it's useful all around the world. The Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup has a ton of resources to encourage you to look for the certain things that you're, you're collecting, um, to chart what you're finding, and that all contributes to real citizen science to make a big difference. In, in the world. So shorelinecleanup.ca, great resource to, uh, yeah, great question, guys. Yes, yeah, so right. we're working with Shoreline Cleanup with the, with the, with the, um, with the, um, the, the um, complicated journey of marine plastics. So. Nice. I <laughs> bet you did. I, there's no one we brought on. I bet you haven't partnered with. You're going to. <laughs> Um, let me bring back in Miss Kump for a question. We'll take a few more. And this is, this has been fantastic. Miss Kump's class, come on in. Share away. Uh, Hello. Hi. Hi. Can you make a new man-made material that is disposable and as durable as plastic? Yes, I think so. And that's where a lot of these companies are working to make um, to make biosynthetic um, replacements. You know, um, plastic, as in, like Daniela said yesterday, has an inherent design flaw in that it um, it doesn't degrade into anything useful. So, so I think um, there's a lot of work being done to make stronger uh, stronger fibers that, when they do degrade, can be used, um, you know, turn into nutrients instead of pollutants. So that's a huge hotbed of research. Yeah. yeah. Again, a really exciting time to be interested in this field, but there's so much going on. Why we're able to do a whole month dedicated to ocean plastic is that there's so many new people doing so many innovative things. So this is yeah, a, yeah. and there's so many cool fabrics. Like this is sizal, you know, <laughs> that you, this you can put your soap in there so your soap doesn't dissolve, but make carpets out of it. This is made from seaweed, seaweed and cotton. Cool. And what's cool about this is that it comes in this biodegradable packaging, you know, that will degrade within, you know, a couple weeks. Um, this is made from, this is made from nettle and it's super strong, much stronger than cotton. Yeah. This is made from lotus, lotus fabric, super mm. soft. Mm. And um, I'll write you the screen. Whoa. So many things, <laughs> <laughs> so many solutions. 
Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Tierney. Oh, I had right. one, one quick oh, thing. Um, you know, dyeing fabrics is really toxic, but yeah. there are all sorts of natural natural solutions. Like, look at this beautiful piece of fabric. Now, this is dyed with um, heather is the greens, the beige is comfrey, the nettle is the dark green, rhubarb is the light green, and yeah. then um, blue is the indigo. Isn't it beautiful? It is beautiful. Yeah. So buy them one right away. I love <laughs> My it. My friend Barry Ritchie did that one. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, we'll take a few more quick questions, guys. You guys have been coming hard and fast with these, which is awesome. So I, I love this question. I'm sure we both have some thoughts on this. So some people say that the plastic we eat are practically harmless. How do you respond to that? <laughs> hmm. I'd say the jury's out. I mean, um, we do know that plastics um, will adhere different persistent organic pollutants like DDTs and PCBs. These are these are pollutants that don't break down and they the plastic is like a sponge and it adheres them and it can concentrate those kinds of pollutants up to a million fold in the ocean. And we've seen that. So um, to say that they're not harmful and then they also can leach out um, they can leach out chemicals that disrupt our endocrine just um, endocrine system like and and mimic estrogen which is a hormone a feminizing hormone so that I, we we don't need to be ingesting that um yeah. artificially so there's a lot of unknowns the experiments are very difficult to do because there's so many variables but i think it's better to err on the side of don't eat it before we know what it does and eating something that's a fossil fuel product can't be good for you. That's right. just common sense. Right. It's one of those things where like there's the, the jury's out. There's a lot more research to be done. But in general, you know, if you think about instinctually, should I eat plastic or not? The answer yeah. should be no. And we want to stick with it being no. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I think it's better to not eat it and do the experiments. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love this. So speaking of eating things, Akash, I uh, wanted to know, is there no mechanism for fishes and other sea creatures to sense that microfibers are not their food? That is a really good question. And I would hope that that animals would be able to adapt to not eat the microfibers. The problem is, is the microfibers get a coating of algae on them. And often it's invasive algae that would never have real estate uh, in the past. So we're seeing new kinds of algaes, new kinds of growth forms on this new real estate going out into the ocean. When the sun hits them, those algae then create something called dimethyl sulfide, which smells like food. So seabirds will come down and they're not stupid. They don't want to eat the plastic, but they see it and it smells like food. And so they'll eat it. So we do have scientific reports um, showing that, that they're mistaking it, um, mistaking it for food because of the algae that gets coated on top of it. Yeah. That's fascinating. I've actually never heard that. No one's ever brought that up specifically in any of our programs. So great question. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that as an answer. And one of the things too is, you know, there's so many pieces out there. If you're a filter feeder, if you're something like a whale shark or a manta ray, and you're taking in these huge gulps of food, they're not sifting between particles that are this big. They take in what they want to take in and a whole bunch of plastic as well. So it's, it's, it's bad. Yeah. It's not a good situation. Yeah, Jesse, that's an excellent, that's a really an excellent point because, um, you know, it's just when you've got so much of it, you can't avoid it. So, right. yeah. So uh, we're near the end of the broadcast, shockingly. I told you, it's like the fastest 40 minutes oh. of your life. Uh, <laughs> so I want to give one last uh, chance for you if you, if there's anything else you'd like to share, sort of a wrap up message, sort of solidify everything you've talked about today uh, to share with kids an action thing that they can go home with. Yes, yes. Well, so I um I hope you can follow us on Around the World and 80 Fabrics on Instagram. But um but more than that, I think, you know, regardless of what you're interested in, this there's so many more there's so many things that you can um, get involved in if you're interested in fashion, if you're interested in design, if you're interested in chemistry, ocean. This is so interdisciplinary. Culture, um travel, there's there's many avenues to, to enter into this, this field. And it's endlessly fascinating. And there's so much potential for good um, that businesses are hungry for these new fabrics, new design ideas, keeping the circular economy in mind that, um, and we need all hands on deck, heavens. <laughs>
So let's do it together. I mean, one of the things that we've been doing all week long, highlighting solutions. You did a lot in your presentation. You actually highlighted a lot of brands and ways that people can get involved. So I'd encourage anyone watching live, tuning in later, check those out, uh, get those brand names and make those decisions. That's the benefit of this is that, you know, the, the sort of central tenet of don't waste, whether that's clothing, emissions, literal litter, uh, food, all of those things make a huge difference towards making a positive impact for the oceans and for ecosystems in general. And so I think we're equipped to, to do just that. And I, I really appreciate you joining us here today, Tierney. And I would hope people, you know, take a look at your labels. Take a look at your labels. Yep. See what your clothes are made of and think before you buy. Fantastic. Well, with that, I'll, I'll say goodbye to you and everyone else. Tierney, thank you so much for joining us and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day.